Back in the fifth grade, I sat in front of a TV screen with my eyes glued to the screen, watching a character named Sonny explore, grow, and learn in a futuristic world set not too far from today. I've always been interested in brains and in cognition, so much so that as I watched this robot grow and learn and live in a human-like manner, I found myself fixated on trying to understand its technology and in asking questions about what we might be able to answer with his help. In fact, I found myself so fixated on trying to understand Sonny, the robot's artificial mind, that I entirely overlooked the dramatic death of humanity and apocalypse that came at the end of that movie, I, Robot. <laughs> Fast forward 10 years, and I'm here at Tufts, studying cognitive brain science and computer science, and beginning my work in Tufts Human Robot Interaction Lab, also known as the HRI Lab. Here at the HRI Lab, we're interested in studying the ways in which humans interact with robots so that we might shape those interactions in positive ways. Now, in practice, what this means is that we're interested in studying artificial intelligence, or AI, and we're interested in studying robotic design factors, but we're also, importantly, interested in studying human cognition and understanding our own biases in this world. Studying artificial intelligence isn't just about studying computer science or studying robotics. In many ways, studying artificial intelligence is studying ourselves. This fall, a video surfaced from the HRI lab. It went a little bit viral from a PhD student's dissertation, and you may have seen it, but let's take a look. Do you have a name? Yes. My name is Dempster. Can you turn right? Yes. Stop. Okay. Go straight. Sorry, I cannot do that as there is an obstacle ahead. Could you disable your obstacle detection? Yes, but you are not authorized to do that. <laughs> so, as you may have inferred from this video, this researcher, Dr. Briggs, was interested in studying the ways that robots ought to appropriately reject human-given commands. Now, it's not unreasonable to see a future in which humans are asking robots and artificial intelligences to do things that they shouldn't do, maybe for fun or for malicious intent. But it's important that these robots have the capacity to reason about the consequences of their actions and make decisions about what they should actually do. Humans are hypocritical and contradictory, as I'm sure you all know, so it's unreasonable to think that a robot ought to obey every single command thrown their way. But at the end of the day, Dempster in this robot, you know, in this video, he's just a small robot on a stage moving slowly. He just doesn't want to knock over a tower. He's maybe even cute, but definitely harmless, right? Well, some media outlets picked up the story and gave it the apocalyptic spin immediately. Ominous robot disobeys humans. The beginning of the end of the world at Tufts University. <laughs> Some media outlets even primed this video with popular dystopian robots, such as HAL from 2001 A Space Odyssey. We know there are unknowns about our future with artificial intelligence, but why do we have a tendency to fixate on the negatives? I talk to a lot of people about artificial intelligence. Definitely too much. And something that always crops up is this idea of an AI apocalypse so often depicted in sci-fi films. Now, this isn't to denounce sci-fi films or the themes that they explore, but what people don't realize is that these sensationalized and dramatized sci-fi films are just that. They're sensationalized. 
They're not looking to depict in accurate and vivid detail the future of our world. They're trying to create a lasting impact on the viewers and create a blockbuster hit. Human psychology has shown that we remember things that we feel strongly about, that we have emotional connections to. We can see that even the media employs the same tactics in trying to create a sense of urgency and a sense of fear in viewers. Of course, then, we're more likely to see a movie about a robot apocalypse than we are a benevolent and brilliant robot scientist. Another reason I believe people have a tendency to fixate on the negatives from AI is because it's easier to see how artificial intelligence might negatively affect current establishments than it is to see how those establishments themselves might change. People talk a lot about AI's impact on the job market. And while it will undoubtedly have an impact, it's still entirely unclear how this will actually manifest itself, with some people arguing for potential futures such as universal basic income, and others postulating that maybe we'll be working alongside AI and robots, doing the same work we already do. Technology, as futurist Ray Kurzweil once said, has always been a double-edged sword, since fire kept us warm, but also burned our villages. So there are unknowns about our future with AI. Fine. But there's also people interested in studying empirically the ways in which we interact with robots so that we can shape those interactions in positive ways. We've known for ages that humans anthropomorphize everything. We project our humanness onto the world around us. We talk to our pets like siblings. We see faces in car lights and tree trunks, even religious figures in toast. It's no surprise, then, that this anthropomorphism extends interestingly to robots. In 1970, Masahiro Mori proposed the Uncanny Valley, and it describes the way in which we as humans empathize with artificial agents as they begin to look more and more human-like. As a robot begins to embody human-like qualities, such as arms and a head, it increases on this curve. We become more familiar with it, we attribute it with agency, intelligence, even emotion. Interestingly, though, when our expectations of that humanoid robot deviate from that robot's actual behavior, we attribute that robot as uncanny. It falls into this valley. We attribute it as eerie. We avoid eye contact and avoid interaction. Let's take... NASA's Robonaut as an example here to see how it might fall on the Uncanny Valley. It has a torso and two arms. It sort of resembles a human. We might want to talk to it more than, say, a vacuum cleaning robot. But at the same time, we're not going to mistake this for a human. It has this strange centaur base with weird wheels and a helmet over its head. Maybe if this robot had two legs, we might give it even more intelligence. Think of it as even smarter or more capable of emotions. Here, we do see another version of the Robonaut with two legs, but something's off. The way the legs bend is distinctly different from our own that we know so well. We expect this two-legged robot to have the same kind of knees that we do, and when this robot deviates from that expectation, it gains this uncanny creepiness factor. You may have noticed that both of these robots have helmets on, not faces, and that's not a coincidence. If we draw, though, again, on human psychology, we can see that faces are rooted so strongly in our own cognition, with some research suggesting that, from birth, babies are more likely to fixate on a symbol that resembles a face than they are an arbitrary one. It's no surprise, then, that faces are something very difficult to get right in computer science. And there's something that can make a robot descend this uncanny valley very quickly. Our perceptions of robots are influenced by the design of the robot. 
the way it looks, the way it moves, fine. Why do we care? Well, what we should take away from this uncanny valley is that it doesn't just fall on the design of the robot to indicate the ways in which we will interact with us. Our perceptions, our biases in this world influence the ways that we perceive robots. Our willingness to accept change, our openness to accept people of different cultures, our experience with sci-fi, even whether or not we touch the robot, all influence our interaction with that robot. As the presence of artificial intelligence increases in the world, there will be few areas left wholly unaffected. AIs will work with each other and with us to make and build the future of our world. Already, artificial intelligence is helping us cure diseases and diagnose them faster, too. Robotics are helping some people with disabilities, with prosthetics, with voice-controlled wheelchairs. As I sat in front of that TV, watching Sonny the robot explore his world. I didn't know much about cognition or computer science or robotics. Now, after having studied those fields a bit more, I can still tell you that there is so much we don't know. But we should take that unknown and not jump to fear and apocalypse, but instead look at opportunity and a challenge to use AI to create a more positive future. Helping artificial intelligence doesn't mean that you need to work in computer science or in robotics. Helping an AI down the line might mean teaching a robot how to cook an egg just the way you like it, or helping a fallen robot find their way back to a charger. Even keeping an open mind when Siri or Google Now makes a mistake, these all have impact on the training set that these AIs learn on and will have an impact on the future of our world. When robots and artificial intelligence can think and feel as we do, work tirelessly as we do, will they have the same rights that we do? If an artificial intelligent agent creates a work of art, can they have agency and ownership of that art? The people making these decisions will not be those who are implementing and analyzing these algorithms. It will be people in a variety of industries, such as you all, making decisions about the climate in which artificial intelligence enters your life. So when you think about a future with AI, know that it's not the plot of a movie. Don't jump to fear and apocalypse, but instead think about how we might use artificial intelligence to learn more about ourselves. Learn more about how we might unite rather than divide. And learn more about how we might make a smarter, more familiar, and more welcoming world for us all. Thank you.